The Military Series is brought to you by Dominion Strength, weightlifting belts, and micro gains, fractional plates. You know, you would never go into training or combat without the proper gear. And from the very beginning of your strength journey, you need the proper fractional plates and a weightlifting belt both of which will last a lifetime. Most gyms, including military gyms, don't have plates less than five pounds. And in order to make smooth incremental increases, you'll need fractional plates. You know, those plates that are one pound, 1.25 pounds and two and a half pounds. Microgains sells entire sets that easily fit in your gym bag so that you're ready to hit your prescribed numbers anywhere you train, anytime you train. And everyone knows that every serious lifter needs a weightlifting belt to help them stay tight and protect you during heavy lifting. Dominion Strength makes the finest all leather weightlifting belts on the planet. And best of all, both Dominion Strength and Microgains are American owned small businesses and 100% of their products are produced and shipped right here in the US of A. Go to dominionstrength.com or microgains.com. That's M-I-C-R-O-G-A-I-N-Z.com and use discount code LOGIC at either one of our partner companies to receive a significant discount off your purchase from either of these wonderful companies. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Dominionstrength.com or microgains.com. Get the best weightlifting belt and fractional plates on the market. Welcome, everyone, to the Barbell Logic Military Series. I'm your host, Nikki Sims, along with host Matt Reynolds. Before we begin, we'd like to say that the views expressed in this series do not necessarily represent those of the Department of Defense or the United States government. All right, welcome back to the military series. I'm Nikki Sims. And today we're going to be talking about the Army and coaching military personnel. And for that, I am joined by our amazing director of client experience and her amazing husband, Jarrett Berman. So sorry, our amazing director of client experience, Nikki. (laughs) We have the same name, so we're like we're the same state of mind sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) And her husband, Jarrett. So welcome, guys. It's really nice to have you you both here. Thank you. Yay. So, um, Jarrett, what is your role in the Army? So right now I'm full time within the Arizona Army National Guard. I have two roles. I'm working as current operations and plans inside the G3's office for the state. I am also the 158th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade's XO. And I've actually just been selected as the next battalion commander for the 850th Military Police Battalion. Well, that sounds cool. cool. (laughs) I'll be honest, I don't know what a lot of those things mean, but it sounds like you're in control of putting things in certain places. (laughs) That would be about the the sum of it, yes. Okay. (laughs) So you lead people, right? Yes. Okay. How many people are you responsible for? When I take over the battalion, it's 566 soldiers. Wow. That's amazing. And let's start in layman's terms. What are their responsibilities? It's a military police combat support battalion. So we do area security, mobility operations, detention operations, police operations, the whole gamut of things basically running from everything from frontline security to rear security of division support areas. Oh, man. Okay. So you are, it seems like you're helpful with keeping everybody in line and safe on military grounds, kind of? Yep. No, that, that's about it. We secure both, you know, we're responsible for the soldier's protection. Yeah, that seems really important. Seems like you guys have actual physical uh, requirements that you need to be able to perform like every single day. Like it seems like a lot of on your feet, getting stuff done, being aware kind of job versus maybe a lot of desk work. Yes, absolutely. Our job is primarily out in the field, mm-hmm. either mounted in vehicles or dismounted, doing foot mm-hmm. patrols, things of that nature. What I hear is moving heavy things around and moving yourself around. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you get to do to train those people physically? Do you have any role in getting to coach them or get them ready for their PT? Yes. My role is more policy side. So I deliver guidance to my subordinate commanders and subordinate leaders. And they are the ones that are directly hands on for providing the in-person training for the Army Physical Fitness Test, what was the Army Physical Fitness Test, now that that's gone away, as well as 
fitness for combat operations. Yeah. If you had your druthers, what would you want your men and women to be capable of? Like, what would be like your screening if you're like, yeah, these are some good strength standards for someone who's going into combat? Really, the first and probably the best is that they can pick up a fellow soldier who's fully equipped with their body armor, weapons, ammo, and pull them out of harm's way into safety. Which is, I mean, how many pounds are we talking when someone is fully loaded? So if we talk about, you know, the average male in the military, probably about 180 pounds body weight. And then if you put on about 40 to 60 pounds worth of gear, Heavy. so anywhere between 220 to 240 pounds fully loaded. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we deadlift that easily. Nikki can deadlift that for like. 40 reps in a row you can deadlift that for like 100 reps in a row <laughs> it's like it's like when you have to drag that like you said it's awkward and it's like you know moving a person around is like a bag of water and it's just like bulky and you have to maneuver it and you can't grab onto it very well so it seems like a really important test absolutely I and mean, it's not just you know picking them up like a deadlift three feet and then you're done you're talking picking them up moving them 20 30 50 yards to safety for yeah. medical to be able to come in there and help them. Oh, and by the way, you're also being shot at yourself. So you have that additional stress going on and you've also gone into combat. So now you've moved, you know, anywhere from 100, 200, 300 meters with all that equipment on yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the single act of deadlifting 240 pounds, putting it down and walking away. Right. You're like, cool, now I'm going to rest for five minutes like a normal power lifter. <laughs> like, it seems like it'd be really nice to know that you will be strong enough to do that so that you can handle all the stress of the external environment really, really well. How do you think that's tested now with the current standards? So they are going to the new Army Combat Fitness Test, the ACFT. That replaced the Army Physical Fitness Test last year. We haven't fully implemented it yet because of COVID and other mm -hmm. things going on as we're moving forward. However, the new test does have a deadlift standard or mm -hmm. three rep max, basically deadlift. They also okay. have a sled drag and carry where you are dragging about 90 pounds for 50 yards and back, a kettlebell run at the same distance, a side shuttle hop at the same distance, and then a sprint all at the same distance as part of a single graded portion of the ACFT. So you can see that they are taking that idea of being able to lift totally. a soldier or service member and pull them out of harm's way Versus the old test, which was simply two minutes of push-ups, two minutes of sit-ups, and then a, a two-mile run. Yeah, it really seems like a step in the right direction. Yeah, they're learning now that we can no longer exercise for the test. We actually have to train for it now. <laughs> yeah. So it was really cool. Last year when we were at Fort Leavenworth, we got to see the dynamic in the gym totally change once they started testing this out. You saw more barbells being used, whether it was correct or not. It was still exciting to see it being used more and yeah. more strength involved. Like it was definitely a step in the right direction. Yeah. You guys did something really cool in Fort Leavenworth, right? You got to actually coach a whole lot of soldiers. Yeah. He got picked for the PT coordinator and, you know, his wife's a strength coach. So awesome. I'm going to be involved in it. And I yep. got to help coach them, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. So like, how did they, did they come into it being like, cool, I want to get strong. Like, tell me what I have to do. Was there any resistance? I would say there was a little resistance from several individuals in the beginning. You have to understand for the army for the past 30 years has been, can you run two miles in 13 minutes? And that oh. was the biggest standard of fitness in the army. So a lot of these guys grew up that way. You know, they've been in the service like myself for 15 plus years, some of them 20 years or more. So that's been ingrained in them. So there was some hesitance going into it to, look, you're going to probably run a little slower because you're going to have to put on a little bit more muscle and more strength. But mm -hmm. this is the way the Army's going. I will say out of the group of 15, including myself, that we had, most of them towards the end saw bigger advantage from the strength training versus the simple running. And quite a few of them that I'm still in contact with today are still part of it and still like to go forward. That actually includes a Navy and Air Force, so not just Army. Hey, that's pretty awesome. You made it stick. Yeah, we started seeing some lifting shoes being bought and belts there we being go. used. That's, was... that's when you really know. When, <laughs> when someone, lifting shoes, like that can be not always a true tell if someone's in or not, because some people are just like gear whores and they want to get the, right. <laughs> get the shoes. But when they get a belt, then they're like, 
oh, okay, a belt's not just about cheating. It's about me getting to get stronger. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and we were lucky. We had a pretty good equipment set up there too. So we were able to get the whole group together and use a few racks and just, you know, separate by height. And it worked out really well. Like, obviously, yeah. it's going to be different from base to base and what mm-hmm. equipment's available, but it was a really good setup there for that. And they got to do it together, which I think is a huge yeah. part of this oh, the whole time. thing. Yeah. Okay, Jared, I'm curious. Were you one of the guys before you leveled up and got with Nikki? Were you one of the guys <laughs> that <laughs> was like 13 minute mile cardio? Like, that's what matters. Or were you strength biased? <laughs> I, I was always partially strength biased. I have ran a 13, 15, two mile. I think it's the fastest I've ever done it. And there okay. were times where I would train just to run the two mile or a 5K over, you know, kind of giving up some of my strength so that I could be able to do that because there was such a stigma attached to that in the army. But yeah. I have always been somebody who prefers moving heavy objects three feet versus running long distance. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Can relate. What is your three rep max deadlift that you, and is, is it a trap bar deadlift for that test? It is. It is a trap bar deadlift. Nice. So okay. I can max that fairly easily. I think my straight bar deadlift three rep max is probably right around 485. Uh, I actually was able to just recently clear 500 pounds on my single rep deadlift. So I'm over that. That is exciting. Awesome job. And your coach is? (laughs) My beautiful and smart wife, Nikki Berman. (laughs) She's amazing. (laughs) Like there's, if there's anyone who can coach their husband, it, it's Nikki. That's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's worked really well with us. Like in the beginning, maybe like the first like couple months, maybe just even just a month, there was a little bit of a learning curve. You know, we were a brand new couple then, though. So, and he actually had been a personal trainer before, so he had a little bit of that going for him too. Like mm-hmm. he knew he knew a good amount. Like he's read the books and things like that too. But yeah. once he let his guard down and started like listening. He doesn't argue back. He does what I say and he sees it works. <laughs> I think I was on the five by five linear progression right. prior to. So yeah. she got me on a little oh, bit more of good. a steady program <laughs> yeah. uh, moving forward. That's great. What have you learned from her coaching you that you've been able to kind of utilize for when you're getting to work with your soldiers or and it doesn't have to be like strictly with lifting, but I feel like just having a coach who cares about your strength can really crossover in some areas so there's a couple things first just the idea of sticking to a schedule and being held accountable to perform Mm -hmm. what you have to Mm -hmm. the importance of form over just trying to lift the most weight as you possibly can and understanding that the program is there to help you so not skipping steps in it a lot of times when i see these soldiers start these strength programs they want to immediately jump to about an 80% of their max and work forward versus <laughs> yes. understanding, nope, you start a little lower, you work on your form and you build yourself up. And then the final, the biggest part is that it's not you competing against somebody else. It's you competing against yourself. So you don't have to worry about the person next to you lifting more weight than you. If mm-hmm. you're increasing your weight and you're moving forward, you're succeeding. Whether someone that you're working with is you know, well ahead of you or even with you or even behind you, you guys can still work out together because you're going against yourself and you're going against your own limitations versus competing against them. So That's one cool. of the big things I put in with a group I did on my last deployment was every time you PR, you got to eat ice cream for, for dinner <laughs> meal. That's a great rule for everybody. <laughs> and it became, you know, that challenge that even now they'll text me like, hey, I got to have ice cream for dinner tonight. <laughs> Good job on your PR. (laughs) That's cool. Like that. I feel like that's a really great sign of a good leader is that you're instead of like creating something that's competitive, which has its use, you're making every person better for themselves, which in turn is better for the whole team. That's cool. Oh, absolutely. From what I've, I guess, seen or read about or watched on band of brothers and stuff <laughs> like it seems like training and like i guess especially preparing for combat is just like getting yourselves into really uncomfortable physical states like running for ages running uphill carrying heavy stuff because there is like a mental fortitude that you have to train and develop would you say that's still accurate no absolutely that's 100 percent it you don't know what you're going to face and how you're going to face it 
or for how long. So you have to be ready to continue going and to push yourself. You know, and strength training, I think, is a great example of that. Just putting a whole bunch of weight on your back sometimes and it's trying to hold you down and you're trying to stand up is almost a great analogy for what you have to go through. And if you can learn that, hey, there's always a way that I've gotten through this, I've had something heavy put on me, I've had hard times, and I've mentally overcome that to be able to continue going, even though, you know, that pain, that voluntary pain was for a temporary period that you're able to push through it. That Mm -hmm. when you get to the involuntary pain, you understand too that, nope, I can push through this. I've done it to myself. I can do it with external influences as well and keep going. Yeah, it seems like having that confidence would be tremendous. Like I would love to be, you know, shoulder to shoulder with someone who can deadlift 485 for three <laughs> like, and knows that's just like, all right, what's coming? Like I can handle this. I can support you and the whole, you know, division or squadron. Is it what's the proper terminology? So those are both right at different size elements. <laughs> okay. So is squadron smaller? Typically, yes. And then it's for cab okay. or air. Okay. So if you want to go through, you know, you go squad to platoons, platoons to battalions, battalions to brigades, brigades to divisions, divisions to corps, corps to armies. Man, at what point in your military career do you learn all of this? <laughs> like, it's amazing. The terminology. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised when you pick it up and how long it stays with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The more I've done these interviews, the more I've appreciated the jargon. What (laughs) what are these things? (laughs) So, Nikki, you've gotten to work with a lot of military personnel. What would you like when you did have to have those interactions where they like kind of weren't sure if they were ready to kind of buy into strength training? How did you like get them to see that strength could be so important for them? I think what Jared said, like that almost changing the mentality of I don't have to be hot and sweaty after every workout. And that's mm-hmm. definitely a kind of like that CrossFit background. Like they come in, clients yeah. sign up for block and they kind of it, it takes a while to get used to the new kind of format and, yeah. you know, educating them, teaching them why we're doing this, why it's effective and letting them experience it. Once someone mm-hmm. dives in and experiences it and is consistent and seeing that progress every session, they start to see, okay, yeah, I can see how this works. This makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely a hurdle at first. Yeah, I could see why, especially because it seems like the culture is all around that getting uncomfortable and training the uncomfortable moment and just doing whatever it takes, like burpees. Who came up with burpees? Was it CrossFit <laughs> or was it the military? Who, who can we blame for that? Whoever it is, they deserve to be shot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, now they're just poor civilians thinking that they have to do burpees. And it's like, no, yep. you don't have to do burpees. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you could do a PT program, what would your PT program look like where it would prepare them strength wise and conditioning wise? Jarrett. I think you have to start with the basic concepts of strength training. So the normal squat, deadlift, bench, and press with the linear progression to start up to build that base. We're never going to be able to get away from the run. However, I'd probably lower it down to more sprinting. I've Mm. had to sprint 400 meter distances more than I've ever had to run two miles. Mm -hmm. So that quick burst to be able to do that with the idea being that at the end of that, you still have to do something. So it's not just like yeah. you said, deadlift and go take a five minute break, running mm-hmm. and then go take a break. It's moving on to the next thing. So a little bit more probably of that type of circuit idea too, of deadlifts into sprints, squats into something where you're continually moving versus preparing for a competition where you do your deadlift and you go wait 25 minutes and then you do your next deadlift yeah. to really build that up. Eat some Sour Patch Kids, listen to some music. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So a little bit more in that regard of being able to do one of these heavy movements or a sprint and then be able to do something immediately following. Mm -hmm. And then again, knowing that you only have about 45 minutes to an hour, if it's a regimented PT session at the unit before Mm -hmm. they need to go and be able to do something else as well. Yeah. So kind of looking at that. Nikki, would you agree with that? Change anything? No. Yeah, I totally agree. It needs to have kind of incorporate all of it with that strength component. Cause that's, what's going to carry over to all those things. And, make everything easier, hopefully. I'm curious what you guys think like the ideal body weight is for a soldier, maybe relative to their height. Like, because there's got to be a point where they're so heavy that 
maybe they can't do, and I could be completely wrong, maybe they can't do what needs to be done or they would be too heavy to get out of a situation. And Maybe there's a point where they're so light that you'd be worried. I'm not sure. So I've seen both and it's hard to say, and that's part of the problem is right now the Army standards flat across the board. Back when I was a field artillery officer, we had 300-pound guys who could not run two miles to save their life. However, they could lift a 100-pound artillery shell, load it in the gun, and fire it all by themselves. That seems pretty And they useful. needed that. Exactly. However, the same individuals, when put into an armored security vehicle or a Humvee, couldn't get in and out of it on their own because they were too big. And they were actually at risk that if something happened, they could potentially injure or kill everyone in the vehicle because no one could get out based on where they were. Mm -hmm. Same thing with some of these other positions. You know, it really is positionally based. Your average infantry soldier needs to be able to ruck march 12 miles with upwards of 80 pounds on their back. So they need to have some size, some muscle, some strength, but at the same time, 12 miles of continuous movement and action. If you're all just big and bulky, that's going to wear you down the same way. So mm -hmm. it's hard to say there's a, a good cross section that everyone can fall into. The current standards, I will say, for the Army body and body composition is based on, I believe, 1950s. So mm. someone my height is only supposed to weigh 195 pounds. Or they're considered overweight. And how tall are you? That's, I'm 6'1". Yeah. I'm 6'1", and I'm normally between 220, 225. Yeah. And he's he's jacked. You guys can't see him, but he's pretty I, <laughs> I usually I usually test out between 17 to 19 percent body fat, depending on yeah. how it's going. And that's well within the Army standards. I have also had soldiers who were deemed underweight, who were a buck 20 at almost my height. And <gasps> it was the same aspect of, OK, yeah, you can run really fast and you can fly like the wind. But if there's a strong breeze in your face, you're getting thrown the other way. <laughs> Yeah. So you got to kind of find that happy medium. And I don't think there is just one set standard that works across the army. I think they have to look at it based on the different jobs out there. Kind of yeah. move forward from there. Yeah. Can it be like a football team where it's just like, oh, you're 215 above. You are on the defensive line. <laughs> like, you can be our running backs where they just like assign you your your military job based off of your stats. <laughs> Yes. And then, but you got to get into the air aspect of it that, you know, the army through all three components has over a million individuals in it. And when you're trying to test all this, you have to have a simple measure that's also cheap that yeah. can go across all branches and all sections to get that good measurement. So it's a totally. balance. It's a balance between mm -hmm. figuring out what's effective for maintaining the standards and then what's effective for actually getting the job done. So you said something interesting there about the ease of being able to test it. And the new test, it has a ton of equipment in it. Yes. So like name all the equipment that's required now. All right. So you have the hex bar and then up that weighs, I think, about 75 pounds. So you have to go up to 340 pounds of total weight. So you need a hex bar and the weight to get up there, as well as interval weights up to it so that you can properly measure mm. at about five to 10 pound intervals throughout. You have a sled that's normally kind of like a carpet sled with some ropes on it, and then two 45-pound weights that can go on that, two kettlebells of 45 pounds each, a pull-up bar, which isn't too hard to find, but you still need one, mm -hmm. and then a track of about two miles as well because you still have that requirement. So new requirements yeah. on there are the weights, the kettlebells, the sled, oh, and the medicine ball for the medicine ball throw. Right. Yeah. And is that all performed like back to back to back? Pretty close. It is a set and you're only supposed to do about five to seven minutes between each until okay. you get to the run. Then you have about 15 minutes between the last event and the run and you do it. Deadlift, push-ups, medicine ball throw. I may have to go back and look at that, but I think I know it's deadlift first, push-ups, medicine ball throw, sprint drag and carry, leg tuck, two mile run. Yeah. Okay. How do you think people should best prepare for that? Well, like we said, like strength train, you know, it's funny when we first got to Fort Leavenworth and I introduced myself to who was he like the PT coordinator, maybe of the gym. And he was telling me about the program they use to get ready for the new test. It had everything besides a deadlift when there was a deadlift involved in the test. Interesting. Because there are a lot of deadlifty movements. There, there. is. And he basically implied <laughs> yeah. that. 
there's not enough trainers or coaches who know how to teach it and can do it in the right way safely. They just weren't comfortable doing it. So Mm -hmm. I obviously, I I enjoyed teaching his PT group how to do it, but obviously it needs that component. It needs that strength component. If you're not training for that, that's going to kick your butt. And we're seeing that, right? The females are struggling with that. The, The knee tuck, the medicine ball throw. You need some strength to be able to do those. Mm-hmm. And because it'll help you recover for the next movement, I would imagine. If you're gassed out by the three rep max deadlift, like that's going to be tough if your back is all fried from that one going into everything else. And that's actually the biggest lesson learned from a lot of these individuals taking this was individually, they can do all these events pretty well. Mm-hmm. By the time you throw them all together and you try to get that two mile run, their leg endurance is gone. So a lot of these guys who are used to running 13 or below, you know, 11, 12 minute, two miles, by the time they get there, they're suddenly running a 15, 16, 17 minute, two mile because their legs are no longer there, which is one of the funny parts when they trained with me at first was they'd all run faster than me on two miles. Yet when we did the whole test together, I was passing them because my (laughs) leg endurance, you know, a 340 deadlift was nothing for me. That was a warm up weights for me. Right. So, so, so therefore, I wasn't really putting too much stress on my legs. The yeah. medicine ball throw was an explosive movement. I could do that, move on. And even the sled dragon carry, pulling 90 pounds and doing everything like that, really didn't hit my endurance level the same as it hit these other guys. Mm-hmm. So, if they're doing a strength program to prepare for it, but they still need to do like a little bit of specific training, like they need to get kind of comfortable with the trap bar, they need to practice the med ball toss and they need to do some running how far out from the test do you think they should start getting a little more specific to the actual test so for the old pt test i knew for me it was always six weeks out six weeks out i had to start preparing for for the pt test and mostly that was the run going from strength training to running and actually always joked that every time i took an army pt test i became weaker because i had to run versus strength (laughs) train for this one i think once individuals understand what it is probably close to the same between eight and six weeks out of going through a little bit of a progression to move themselves back up Mm -hmm. with the understanding that, you know, six weeks of training on this is not going to get you a very high score. You're going to be able to pass. You're going to be competitive, but it's not going to be a top end score to be competitive and top end. This is strength training year round. This is getting ready and then preparing for the run in addition to probably. But I would say still about eight to six weeks out from the ACFT starting to really focus on it. That's not too bad. It doesn't need to be like a six month kind of journey to get really good at med ball tossing. Yeah. But hopefully they see the benefit of continuing this strength lifestyle and doing it year round. Like we saw, like we said, we saw the dynamic change in Fort Leavenworth. So hopefully Mm -hmm. once this starts back up again after COVID and all that, we start seeing that again. Yeah. I got curious, like, I wonder if a good strength-based culture would be useful for when someone retires or is maybe honorably discharged from the military. Do you think that would kind of create something that gives them a good kind of habit when they leave? Yeah, absolutely. And most do, you know, coming out of the military, most have a pretty good physical fitness level. Now the army breaks you pretty often. And 20 years in the army is about 40 years in normal life for what it does on wear and tear. Sure. But yes, I mean, for the most part, if you have a good strength foundation and you're moving forward, it will help you afterwards. And it helps you during too. I have a bad knee injury. I've had to have a complete ACL reconstruct. And I have found that when I am not strength training, when I'm not doing my squats is actually when I suffer more relapses and injuries with that knee because my stability is increased through my strength training. So Mm -hmm. I think that would also help in that regard as well. One quick thing I like to throw into that. So I feel like that's the same kind of concept as when they're deployed, giving them this focus. Oh, yeah. I love training military personnel when they're deployed. I mean, they have, at least right now, Jared's explaining how it's the culture's changing to where they may not have these gems and this time to train. But right now they have the time. It gives them a focus. They don't have the regular everyday life distractions, family distractions. That's when their compliance is so high. Right now I have a client that's deployed and he's just killing it on nutrition, his workouts. And it's, you know, he's planning on continuing all the way until he's back 
And it's exciting to see him like, you know, it's probably kind of a connection too to the the big world, like that yeah. constant connection to your coach and getting that constant feedback yeah. probably feels good. That's probably a good time for them to like chase PRs too, huh? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. even if they had this long day at work, Jarrett was explaining like, there's still hours to fill. Like you don't really do anything <laughs> besides sleep, eat, work, and then train. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't go Netflix and chill with your wife, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you're not running to the grocery store because you have, you know, meals most of the time are provided. So you take out yeah. those little errands here and there. And yeah, if you're working a 15-hour day, 16-hour day, mm-hmm. you're still going, okay, I can go back and sleep for six hours, seven hours, and I still have a couple more hours in my day. What am I going to do with it? Mm-hmm. So that leads me to a question. Probably don't want to actually lift more than four times a week, right? I think a four-day split's probably a good balance because they do have okay. long days at work. So I'm finding that mm-hmm. like right now, this client in particular is working mm-hmm. really well. Four days, four shorter workouts are fitting well in the schedule. Okay. Do you find that they want to do other things on the remaining three days of the this week? This guy, no, but I've had that for sure. And, you know, he just started back up. He's building that base back up. So once we get that base built up, I could yeah. see a little bit more conditioning coming in. So he, he wants to take this chance to really lose some weight too. So okay. we're going to take that into account once he gets that strength base built back up. Yeah. What kind of conditioning do you think would be the best to do? Like on deployment when they have a variety of equipment available, but like some, you know, I would imagine I would be super bored and would want to do something almost every day. What do you think would be okay? I mean, he, this guy has access to a really awesome big gym. So, I mean, we've got Concept 2 rowers, really anything, Prowler, anything oh, we could want to do, he has. So nice. I think it'll depend on the base and what they have access to. But I love rowing. I love Prowler, Aerodyne bike. Those are great to fit in. They're not going to yeah. wear them out. They're not going to cut into recovery too much, but just give yeah. them that conditioning component. Have either of you dealt with, maybe Jarrett yourself or either of you with clients? situations where they're deployed and they just don't have great lifting equipment and they still want to get strong. Oh, absolutely. What's that like? Especially in the beginning of some of these conflicts we're in now where there weren't the dedicated bases out there with the gyms, the McDonald's, the defects where you were living more in an expeditionary environment. Mm -hmm. The hard part on that is for the most part, survival and your day-to-day tasks are what you're focusing on. Now, I have seen somewhere that you start to get a little bit more of a secured environment or a little bit more of a stationary. And then a lot of the times you have makeshift equipment. Uh, my favorite's always been the metal bar with two cement coffee cans on either end or, or five-gallon sure. jugs just to put weight on it. The call it the uh, prison yard weight sets kind of built <laughs> yeah. out there. And if you don't have that, you know, there are always body weight workouts and things like that that you can do to continue your strength. And that's really kind of looking forward to what the Army could potentially find itself going forward is those expeditionary type environments where there's not a base to go back to every night, where you're in the field on the lines for a majority of the conflict and you're performing your duties for that entire time. And part of that is going to be going into that with a strong foundation and a strong base. Because you could be in there for a long period of time. And like we talked about, having those additional stressors put on your life and trying to maintain and move forward Mm -hmm. where you may lose your cardio endurance or something like that quicker in that environment because you aren't able to go out and run. You aren't able to do anything. You're able to maintain your strength endurance to keep performing your duties for a longer period of time. Yeah. So I think that it sounds like we'll be switching more towards prepping for these deployments Mm -hmm. more than planning on actually training while they're gone. I feel like it'd be really a tough thing to deal with mentally to be like, oh, I got super strong before this deployment. And then I come back and all my lifts are down like 100, 200 pounds. (laughs) Well, again, but we're thinking of where we've been for the last 20 years. You know, this is going to be the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan. We have been fighting an insurgency and a low intensity conflict for the last 20 years. Our look into the future is moving back to that large scale combat operations, what the Army refers to as LISCO, against a near peer adversary. So, looking more back into the initial invasion of Iraq, Desert Storm, what those conflicts looked like against an adversary that is 
close to to equal to what our capabilities are. And in that type of environment, you're going to see hybrid threats where there is no safe area to go back into, where there is no fob to go into, that every area is contested. And if we put large amount of troops in one area for too long, they're going to be attacked by indirect fires, ballistic attacks, things of that nature. So it's not going to be soldiers worried about losing 100 pounds off their max. It's going into these environments with the strength to be able to perform your duties at a high intensity zone for a longer period of time without a break, without a rest. And then when you come home, you're just going to be happy to be home. True. You're going to have so much ice cream. (laughs) Okay, final question. If you could create a super soldier, what would their physical characteristics and mental characteristics be like? Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, So (laughs) physical characteristics, it's kind of like what we talked about before. There are a few soldiers out there who have actually been able to max this new ACFT. What you typically see are your, not your day-to-day CrossFitters, but your high-end CrossFitters, your ones who are okay. understanding actual movements, compound movements and forms, but then mm-hmm. are also able to run. Uh, so you're looking at your, probably for males, your 200 to 220 pound, more lean, being able to still run. Not the abs that are like the sucked in abs, but like the sticky yes, abs. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, probably more of your Thor type bodies than yeah, your Spider-Man yeah. type bodies. If we want to go that route where everyone can there kind of go. indicate or see what it is. Uh, but also not going to your Hulk bodies where you're just this massive guy who can't move too fast either. Yeah. Can't get through the doorway. So, you know, that finding that sweet spot between being able to be skinny and run really, really quick, but also being strong enough to move what you need to move is going to be where you're going to have to kind of find your body styles. And then mental toughness is always the biggest thing. If you have somebody who's not willing to quit and keep moving forward, no matter what the situation throws at them, that's what Mm -hmm. you want. Now I'm curious, how is that kind of fortified? Like you start with day one boot camp. Who knows if you're that kind of person? How is that brought out of someone and trained and really refined over time in the military? Well, like you said, it starts at, at basic training or at boot camp for the Marines that you're broken down out of what society kind of teaches you. And then you're built back up and you're built back up in a way that shows that it is not just you, it is your team. So in mm. the military, your team is more important than the individual. So you're yeah. shown that through your team, you can accomplish pretty much anything so long as you support each other and move forward. And then with that, you start gaining more confidence in yourself operating inside that team and the confidence and mutual trust that you have with each other, with your subordinates, with your superiors, that everybody understands their job and is able to perform it and that everybody is dedicated to continue to move forward. And they always say that You can run faster in a group than you can by yourself because it's the shame of letting your peers down because you can't keep up with them. That kind of motivates you to keep going faster, harder, longer. And then you see you can do that. You know, the hardest thing to do is sometimes pass that next weight group, right? You put 245s on the par for a bench and bench 225 Mm -hmm. can hold you there for a while. Then you get it and you jump up to 240 real quick because you got through that mental gap. Or the first time, you know, going to the running, the first time you run a 13 minute, two mile is really hard. Then you realize you can do it and you're able to continue moving forward. So that's just what the army kind of teaches you going. Have you had any specific leader really give you like a good example or a good deep learning experience of that? Yes, I've had quite a few through my career that I've learned from. And the opposite too, you sometimes learn more from those who don't show you the right example that you understand, okay, this is not what I want to be. But I've had both and both have shown me and I've picked up different traits from all of them moving forward. And it really does help going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you're moving into pretty big leadership position, like, do you have a goal for like the culture of your battalion? So even though it's a, uh, unfortunately comes from a Michigan coach for football, (laughs) uh, I'm a huge (laughs) Ohio State fan. So, but, you know, (laughs) give credit where credit's due. Uh, The 
<laughs> Very honorable of you. <laughs> the philosophy that I've always kind of moved forward with is you're either getting better or you're getting worse. There is no staying the same. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Makes you want to grow for sure. That's cool. Well, that was pretty inspirational there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of a Thor super soldier too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode with Talking About the Army with Jarrett and Nikki Berman. It was really fantastic to have you guys such a strong duo. <laughs> and that's it for today. We'll see you on the next episode. 